Hello and welcome to the Loving Legacy podcast episode 25. Can't believe we've got to a quarter of a century already. This time it's a good one, it's a long one too. I'm speaking to Jacob LaForce all about value stream mapping, continuous delivery and products as a platform or platform as a product. Which way around is it? Interesting discussion. I hope you enjoy it. Let's crack on. Thanks for joining me today. Jacob, maybe you can introduce yourself and tell me who you are and who you work for and what you do. Yeah, so nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So my name is Jacob. I'm based close to Helsinki in Finland. And uh, yeah, I come from a technical background, but I, I was involved in founding a small consultancy where we practice things like CICD and cloud architecture and try and couple those two together to help software teams deliver good software. So that's it in a nutshell. Nice. And how long has the company been going for? Yeah, we, we, we started in 2017, or at least that's when, you know, when we gave it a name and hired our first employee. And it was more than just, <laughs> just me running around doing my own thing. Growth and scale was never the, like the real goal. It was more about building a nice place to, to work and be and have, have a fun time doing it. So, um, And how did you kind of transition to that idea that I want to start something? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so I was I was working for um, another company who were who were resellers of um, testing tools. So we were reselling static analysis and, and unit testing tools. There was other stuff too, but those were the two primary things, mainly for C and C plus plus in the embedded space. Um, and they, yeah, they they were resellers, so they didn't own the tools. Other companies developed the, the 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 products, the tools, and then we were we were selling them and and doing you know customer support and uh, also into implementation integration and these sorts of things for getting it up and running. So that was when I entered the the the, the industry and CI was you know just taking off. So uh, people were looking at tools like um, like cruise control and so on, and then suddenly the new kid on the block, Jenkins, appeared. Uh, and when and was this time-wise? Kind of uh, 2011, 2012-ish. So yeah, I got Jenkins plonked on my desk, like <laughs> learn this because people are using it. Yeah, I got involved in writing plugins and such for that, and and basically helping teams to implement static analysis and unit testing as 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 part of CI as well. And um, together with my brother, we we created a franchise E of that business, so the same company name, and we started a business in an audit, which we did for a few years. It was it was really fun and and, and good. But more and more, I felt like I I didn't want to be involved in selling tools. I wanted to just be helping people implementing these tools. Yeah. And we we came across uh, doing our work a company called Brackma, who were based in Denmark, also had an office in in Sweden and Norway. So. Um, uh, that, that, that kind of like sparked the idea that like, okay, so I could be doing pretty much exactly what I'm doing, but without having to sell tools and be yeah. completely unbiased and really helping teams. So that's when that started. So we, we already had some contacts in the industry and already had, um, you know, an idea of what we were going to do. What we needed was a, you know, was a project to start on and that project scaled quite quickly. So within, within the first year of Arifa, we were like five or six people already. Wow. Um, uh, and yeah, we didn't realize how we were handed, handed a golden nugget right at the beginning because <laughs> I thought everything was easy at that point. Like yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then, and then nothing like that ever really came along afterwards again, at least not as, not as easily. And that was kind of a shock as well, coming from the employer perspective, because I think it was almost too easy that, okay, you have, you have project, they have a need, you know, good people in your network or something, you know, I'll just hire one of them. And then slowly it starts to dawn on you that that project won't last forever. Now that person's going to be off the project and it's kind of your responsibility. At least I, I took it as my responsibility to then not just find me a project, but find them a project. And that, like that pressure was something I hadn't foreseen at the beginning. I guess the, the lesson I learned now where we are today as a company is that um, everything's quite transparent within the company. We have things like open salary uh we have all the, the the project rates and the hours that people spend on projects and all of the timesheets and things open in in a dashboard as well so we can see every month what the hygiene of the company is that are we working enough to be sustainable um, and the goal is 10 percent profit people are quite autonomous in making their own making their own decisions and also have a say in which projects they like to be involved with and which they wouldn't and i think that that kind of um maturity in the company then eases my 
burden a lot because people mm -hmm. take take it upon themselves almost to find projects to make sure they have good work and and ensuring the rates are good as well because everybody has an active interest in in yeah in the success of the company so amazing so it's almost like a would you say like a b corp or a social enterprise in some ways as well yeah, I mean, there, there are now these consultancies that are um, coming out like you're basically a freelancer. Uh, you, you get a minimal salary if you're not on a project. Um, but then if you're on a project, you get a, a cut of the of the, the like the, the amount you bill as well. Uh, and we explored this kind of models, too, which is less like, OK, you're an employee here. Uh, you, you know, just work and, <laughs> and have your salary versus, you know, you're kind of a freelancer. Uh, you get the benefits of being a freelancer without the risk. Um, and I, I think we're, I mean, we're somewhere in between, um, but there's no, there's no risk. You know, if you're off, if you're on the bench and you're off work, then, then you, you know, your salary is not affected. People know what everyone else's salaries are and what the competitive industry is. I don't know any other companies doing this. I only know of those sort of two, two models. So, uh, but I, I think it's, I think it's working. It certainly creates more of a community within the company as well. And that, that was always a goal. I mean, we didn't want to be a, a an empty shell in a way that, you know, we have all these people working here, but they're off on their own projects. And, you know, we, we're not a company ourselves. We really wanted to be our own company as well so yeah yeah exactly like, more like a collective really excellent so that kind of also it seems to be the mission that you take into your work as well so when you go to a company and do for example so you mentioned CICD so typically you might go into a company and then what implement or help with process or how, how does that kind of look on a typical engagement yeah varies a lot and it's changed a lot as well in the early 2010s and, and sort of mid 2010s, I think CI was still this, you know, like challenge. <laughs> People would ask if you're doing CI and it really was a yes or no answer. Yeah. Uh, or like, yeah, you know, we, we, we've automated our builds um, uh, because it was a challenge. You know, you needed to run your own tools. The ecosystem wasn't as well integrated. You couldn't just go on Stack Overflow or ask chat GPT, like <laughs> 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 write, write me a GitHub Action CI pipeline for my Node.js yeah. project or something, you know um so it was it was really like a, a much bigger challenge then so we we were i would say much more hands-on with with setting up those things and and being teams with it and now, nowadays I, I mean we're still really hands-on but i would say that the challenge is no longer so much of the the technical one like picking a tool and creating you know writing a yaml file or whatever it's more like you know how how does the team uh get value from this how do we build a process that helps bring value to the company? Uh, and it's usually not so much with the CI. The challenge then comes further downstream. But then you have you know massive automotive projects where you have like millions of lines of code and hugely complex build processes. And then you know you could have an entire team just trying to solve <laughs> like optimizing CI and solving yeah. some of the challenges. And there. also it depends on how you define yeah. CI as well, because if you're like on the Dave Farley side where it's like you really need to do this all the time, it needs to be fast as opposed to we can do it once overnight, once a day overnight kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And maybe it's not always a one size fits all. It's not always, it's not always possible. Uh, should be a goal though. It's not always, it's not always so, so straightforward. You know, you can't just have a Docker image with, with all the things you need in it. Um, no, because that in itself is going to be a configuration headache to create. It's really kind of looking at a subset of what actually happens in the real world, because you end up with, um, yeah, there's a piece of software at the middle of all your stuff, but then there's this huge configuration around it, which you have to take into account every time you want to test something. So that's when CI becomes so complicated because you end up with these, and this is, again, talking of Dave Farley, where I kind of agree about the end-to-end -end testing is almost meaningless, you know, because you have to you have to look at your stuff in kind of component size, but then at some point you've got to do it in a in a, in a context which works, which works for you. And automating to that level is very tricky and takes a lot of time yeah yeah absolutely i think my favorite catchphrase at the moment is just uh, it depends i think this is a very interesting point as well that the mistake that i've made in my work so being a consultant and trying to help companies with with ci and better ways to deliver software uh, i don't want to couple ci and cd together too much because I, th I think they are different disciplines and everyone has a habit of saying ci cd but um, yeah, for sake of clarity, like, like beyond CI, um, 
then then it's very easy to go and and do your research and do your reading and and you know read some blog posts about how people did something you know amazing and it saved them so much time and the tooling they use they'll go to conferences and get seduced by all these new things and um you know i i was one of the people who came in and they were using tooling that i didn't agree with or ways of doing things that i didn't agree with or didn't think were you know the best so i you know i'd be there actively telling that if you want to be good you know you should be doing this and i just think back how I would do things differently today because because there is no one size fits all when it comes to you know the the best practice or or you know what's the what's the best way of of, of doing this um it's really going to depend on who you have in your team your team size the organization that you're part of as well because some things just might not be in, in your control or even in your team's control or take so long to change so you have to you have to work with what you've got and 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 that's when it really it really depends um so coming in and trying to tell people how to be better at, at what they are doing their day to day work is completely the wrong approach i mean it wasn't anything ludicrous you know jenkins was the ci tool and people were using all kinds of weird stuff and we were like yeah you should use jenkins i'm sure there's so many people who who were doing the same thing back then um mm -hmm. And still are, you know, we, because are, yeah. it's difficult for a consultant coming in because you need to be seen and like any, like a manager, for example, when they, when they start, in a, in a, anyone who starts in a role, you want to have an impact, especially a manager, because you feel a bit paranoid about things. You want to, oh, let's change something for the sake of it. But for a consultant coming into a gig, you want to say, okay, we can change something and we can make an impact straight away. So making a noise and saying, let's change the tooling or whatever is something that yeah i've defaulted to as well completely and sometimes it's right sometimes it's wrong what you realize when you get into the weeds of any decision like that is it's never as simple as that of course as well especially if it's a, a well integrated tool or something that's people at other departments are depending upon um and something i've found really i don't know if you have you read team topologies at all yeah i have I've done lots and lots of research around, and I'm I'm still in the process of reading it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there's a there's a bit in there. Well, there's a couple of things that sparked me when you were just talking around. Yeah, the, the communication because that's one thing that's very clear in team topologies is getting your team responsible for its own its own area of interest as much as possible, so that they can actually release whenever they they can do or have things within their control. But secondly, defining the interfaces, the communication interfaces between those teams, particularly and tooling is a big part of that. And that's what I've seen over and over again. There's Jira, for example, or any other um, project management slash agile tool gets in the way and has maybe been um, specialized or created in such a way that there's a, there's a workflow or a template, which some people have kind of put together over a period of years. Very difficult to unpick the social technical kind of buzzword thing, but it's very true. The social technical side of software development is, is really coming to the fore now. I think it's not a moment too soon. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. And and one of the things that I love about reading the the beginning of Team Topologies, anyway, the first chapter where it covers this, um, like the the architecture of teams and the the communication channels, and also the architecture of software, basically Conway's law described in a really good way, <laughs> and, and like proving it as well in some way using existing research and so on. I I think that's really interesting because I always thought software architecture was you know like a technical more of a technical challenge but um that's really eye-opening to think that like sure when it comes down to it at the end it is a technical challenge but the the way those technical decisions are made are so heavily influenced by the way the organizations and the teams around us are structured as well and i think this applies a lot to to releasing software as well not just you know the software but the way like the way you are releasing software and i think where that 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 is going is is more on the, the the idea of platform engineering now. So platform engineering as a product almost within companies. Every software team is going to need this this stack of tools, and they're going to need to operate within this organization and within these um, ideas. If there's some compliance regulations and so on as well that the company have, then then not every team should need to reinvent the wheel. But again, I'm, I'm I because yeah, platform engineering is very much the buzzword at the moment, isn't it? As well, like DevOps is dead. Platform engineering. I don't understand how platform engineering and devops have anything to do with each other essentially i, I see I, I don't know i don't know how you see the definition or, or understand it yeah but it's really interesting because uh, i have a i have a colleague who did for his master thesis the relationship between configuration management and devops because you know, he's he's really into config management at least 
I think he is. <laughs> not quite sure if it's a joke by now or not. Uh, but yeah, everyone's then saying that con- configuration management is dead. And it's it's the same thing. It's like, no, it's not dead. All of the practices and all of the things that were part of configuration management, now people just call, you know, DevOps. <laughs> and to, yeah. to have called that uh, DevOps in the beginning was just wrong. Um, but it, it was sort of an easy, an easy way because they needed a name. And you know, yeah. DevOps was this thing about bridging, well, why... bridging teams and breaking down silos. That's it. But why do we need a name all of a sudden? It's like now it's like of mode. But in the back in the day, you would just build tools because you needed good tools, you know. And I watched yeah. the John Romero talk a couple of weeks ago, where he goes over his top ten programming tips, or whatever. And he was one of them is tools are the most important thing that you can do to build to build good software. You have to build your own tools, basically. And this is what we're kind of catching up with again now. It's like IDPs or developer platforms things like backstage navigating all this stuff is getting more it's been complicated for 10 plus years already it's getting more and more complicated by the minute almost you know yeah i think i think i um yeah <laughs> it depends how many beers i've had i'm just so i'm just so impartial to it now because you know it happens all the time like GitOps came out and suddenly it was you know GitOps everything and then people are like well what's wrong with cd there actually was a you know the, 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 there is something behind it there is a there is a subtle difference or or like there is some something that GitOps is trying to encapsulate which is primarily around you know the, the reconciliation it's not just fire once and forget until the next time but more like reconciliation and state management and so on um but i i i feel like platform engineering it again is a is a buzzword but the, there is something to it because what i have seen most devops teams or, or what would now be called platform engineering teams it's a collection of tools um they get asked to run tools that they use yeah. as part of the development stack and um they finally spit here on this as well to reference him again he, he calls it design by accident um so nobody really masterminded this platform it was more like okay here's some dudes uh we're gonna you know we're gonna run all of our stuff in in aws eks or whatever uh could be any platform and and here's some here's some tooling that we're gonna we're gonna run to support the the developers yeah. and 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 kind of like that's the platform yeah and i like that's yeah that's fine it's helpful but I, what i really like now about the direction this is taking and the reason why I, I don't get so annoyed when i hear these buzzwords because i think there's more to it than that there is the developer experience on top of that and starting to look at these things with a product mindset really does help to to facilitate that um so things like onboarding and, and offboarding for users and and not just you know, here's here's the Kubernetes API, write some YAML, but maybe we should build a CLI because, or, or use something from the crazy CNCF landscape that, you know, write your code, write some simple config. And, you know, we, we know how you're going to run and deploy it because we own the platform. Maybe you don't even need to know that it's Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you just run the CLI and then here's your dashboards, m- metrics, logging, you know, everything you need to access it and debug it. Just, just to drill into that bit, um, a little bit. So how does that work? So if you say you have created this great platform for a N development team or a team to build some build a microservice or whatever service on it, yeah. when it comes to support, the kind of the you build it, you run it kind of thing, because that still apply if they don't understand what's going on under the covers in the platform. I think it depends. And um, again, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, one of the, one of the things that I think people often believe is that a platform needs to have one abstraction layer. it needs to have one api like you have one persona that you cater for and i think that's a wrong assumption um i think catering like if a platform team does extra work to cater for two people it means that or two personas it means that those two personas have less work to do and that's much more scalable that one central team does the upfront work so you could have the, the people who don't really need to learn and have some kind of like wrapper around it the information that it produces, like mm-hmm. um, logs, some kind of dashboard, um, you know, may- maybe once they visually see that there's pods and that there's a, a deployment and that there's, you know, different resources, you know, you don't need to know Kubernetes. You can see the the resources and, you know, you can see one is green and one is red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think having that abstraction layer for the typical people is good. And then if, why not have another abstraction layers for, for those snowflakes or the ones who, Mm-hmm. you know like oh we know what we're doing just give us access to the api it's like well you don't need to use the same abstraction layer no i i think getting that abstraction layer uh the api layer for the platform is such a difficult thing to do everyone, as well. 
because I see I've seen in various places that I've worked that with an experienced <laughs> consultancy, you know what they're doing in Kubernetes land. Fine, you can go in there, you could probably create this, and you've done it before somewhere else. What I've seen typically up until now is that they're they're inventing an IDP or a developer platform or a platform for the first time, and they're making mistakes as they go. So the product, the productization of that Kubernetes or whatever it is layer is not really there yet. So considering how fast things are moving in terms of it's like some developers still don't know what Docker is, you know, so, and that's fair. That's fine. You know, they shouldn't have to necessarily, but I can't believe that anyone could consider configuration as a configuration management as a concept to be dead or even close to dying, because as far as I can see, it's only growing, you know, with all this stuff, because it's so vital to what we deliver these days. And that's, that's the a, a natural hangover from, having said goodbye to data centers or at least having said goodbye to bare metal, essentially. Since everything has become more software-oriented, including networking, it's inevitable that software engineers, whoever they are in whatever shape, way, shape, or form, are going to have more load pushed towards them. So uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned um, productization there as well. I think that's really key, is that we're really getting product thinking into what you used to be seen as more mundane engineering everyday kind of stuff when it comes to building these things so you need to be quite multi-dimensional to be able to you know, not as a, like a alien but you know what i mean in terms of what you know your experiences but also what you hope to achieve through your through your platform um to deliver something which is meaningful so i suppose the point i'm trying to make here is that it can depend on the organization how much effort you want to put in how much money you want to spend to be able to get that platform up to a level where it's useful um, and I suppose that's playing out right now. I don't, there'll be winners and losers in that kind of world as well, too. Yeah, and that, that, like, I think I think getting that product mindset is it's not difficult if you if you've been building products before. The challenge is that most people haven't maybe been so involved in building a product where you where you look more from our use cases that we expect to to solve and this is how we expect people to interact with the system so what's like the minimum thing that we need to do to fulfill this use case um usually it's more like okay we need these tools so let's test all these tools and make sure these tools are all great and then we'll kind of slap on the thin wrapper for the user at the end and i think the th this is what i was talking about with getting the abstraction layer to be good is and um, and why it's 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 quite difficult as well because it's very use case driven you know how do you expect people to interact with it but once you define that abstraction once you start giving people a cli or giving them yaml or giving them you know something that they work with that's like an api now and changing that is going to have a big effect on your user base so if you've chosen the wrong abstraction and they're almost too coupled with your with the system like specifically with tools that you're using in your in your stack as well. What if you want to change that tool and add something else? Now everybody's going to be affected and you have to migrate everyone. I think it's very, I mean, it's not like it works every time. There's obviously going to be exceptions and so on, but generally aiming aiming for that is a um, is something that often comes too late um, from yeah. from what I see. And can it can it effectively be done as well, I suppose? Can you, because you're kind of guessing, aren't you, I suppose, when you, when you build that, abstraction in the first place that something else is going to come along in five minutes and and you want to add it and suddenly yeah i've got to rethink my architecture now and then suddenly you've got backwards compatibility problems potentially or whatever else i've not been involved in a like i suppose um a platform rollout from that perspective at this level like when it's productized i've seen what you what you've described before so i've seen it where it's just kind of like let's, let's just make it up as we go along and this will this will do and i've known that to be acceptable but then of course you're tightly coupled as you say so is that wrong because then underlying that you've got like for example eight for, yeah for a concrete example i worked uh, somewhere where there was there was a twin cloud strategy if you call that a strategy at the time um so there's aws and azure and the two platform teams there you could call them um went on very different strategies for their platforms towards their user base so one was very focused around security and identity and access management and almost had an intake with teams before they were allowed to use the platform the second was very much self-service focused as well so when you talk about personas or very different ways of looking at it could, could, could you be that flexible in a single platform for example or is that even too abstract to contemplate i mean if you have a if you have a small fairly small user base and you know that they are very technically competent and let, let's say the platform is more solving the problem that, and let's continue on the Kubernetes bandwagon mm -hmm. as well. 
Um, so let's say that they're very confident and capable with that. But what we what the problem we're solving is that we don't want teams to have to manage and maintain all their own Kubernetes clusters. Mm-hmm. And, you know, getting a Kubernetes cluster to production is not like you know GKE create cluster it's like okay you're still going to want your monitoring and logging maybe you want your secrets management you probably want some networking in there you know you're going to basically add a whole bunch of stuff there afterwards so um, maybe the platform is providing production ready kubernetes clusters as a service in which case the abstraction layer will be the kubernetes apis for the most part and maybe that's fine but if you take a team who's maybe not so comfortable with using Kubernetes and don't even want to care that their stuff is running in Kubernetes, then then you'd want to move that abstraction layer up, right? So, and, and usually the bigger the company and the bigger the team, so the general level of competence that you can assume does go down a little bit. I mean, if you have five people, you need to hold their hands. It's not going to take much time. If you've got 500 people, you need to hold their hands. It's not a possibility. So it's, it's maybe not just the the level of competence, but just the, you know, the, the scalability of it. Um, so that's where you'll balance your effort that you'll basically say, yeah, depending on the size of the organization and how many users we're going to be impacting, then we can put more effort into it and spend time accordingly, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. And again, it is not like you need the one abstraction layer. You could always start with, you know, Kubernetes as a, as a service kind of thing. Um, and then, and then realize that, oh, but actually most of the teams using this, um, they don't need to. They don't need all this low-level detail. So let's just give them something like a CLI or something that they can, you know, press the run button and put it up in CI or, or use something like Argo CD or something if you want to do GitOps and and you know abstract away the the implementation of it. But obviously not so far that they have no idea what's going on. It's not just enabling to deploy, but enabling to debug and to to upgrade, to roll back, to you know. Indeed. And that's fine for a greenfield system or systems that we're creating in you. What about when you're interfacing with existing, well, you're going to be touching on legacy systems at some point as well. How can you or can you integrate a delivery process around existing systems and see benefit, I suppose? Or is it just going to slow things down? This is a really good segue into the reason how, how, how we got in contact as well, yes. which, is, which, is, which, which, which is value stream mapping. Because this is something that I really love to do with teams. Um, and for me, if I had to serve software development teams, if, if, if there were software development teams already working today and um, I was brought in to build some kind of internal developer platform, the first thing I would go and do is to go and run con- uh, value stream mapping workshops with the, with the different software teams. So how would you go about that then? How would you yeah, engage with teams in the first instance? Yeah, well, I'm not a guru in this area. Uh, I got introduced to value stream mapping by by colleagues that I work with. So I'm just going to explain my view of value stream mapping first. So it was from, you know, factory floors and how to optimize them. That's where it originated from. And it's been adapted to software. And I think most people still do it quite mathematically that, you know, we, 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 we it's a, it's a flow, a flow chart of how we go from some point to an, another point, uh, which is to describe how we, how we deliver value. Um, and um, people put, you know, how much time they spend in each box and these sorts of things in it. We just do it very informally. Um, so we just ask teams that, let's say we start from somewhere. I mean, ideally, you have pretty large coverage. But if we're taking platform engineering, let's say, we, we could say that let's start from you have a, a feature in your backlog. How, how are you going to take that feature and put it into production and also get feedback from production? That that could be a really good scope for a value stream mapping exercise, and then what what we do is I would ask the teams to to just start drawing with you know arrows and boxes, either on a whiteboard or you know in some online tool. So what do you do? Do you do you create a branch? Do you start hacking and coding? What about when you get to to using version control? And how's your merging process? Do you do trunk based or you know whatever? Um, how's your CI? What does that do? Once we've got the happy path, because that's the usually the, the easy one, then let's start to focus on the edge cases. Like what happens if CI fails? What happens if something in production fails? And now we start to get, you know, the happy path value stream map is now starting to split and diverge. And we start to see the daily struggles that exist with the pain. With yeah. Software. yeah. But then we have some waste cards. We have eight categories of waste, things like uh, manual work, handover, queue, uh, waiting but usually we find that waste is part of one of those types um, and we ask people to annotate the the value stream map so where do you experience waste during this process um, and we might do some kind of 
prioritization there to find out which wastes are you know more severe than others and we might talk about is this a symptom or a problem because um some wastes are themselves the problem and if we solve this then you know we <laughs> we alleviate it but a lot of the times wastes are a symptom because mm -hmm. of some problem upstream or some waste upstream and that's kind of like the the deliverable in a way in terms of a diagram in terms of a value stream is is just that like here's how you release software here's the waste here's all the you know the edge cases and things and and now we can have a really good constructive conversation about how to improve because we no longer need to motivate people to change so. yeah indeed but do you find often you also get stuck in the weeds of potentially the backlog as well so maybe you look at the, the existing backlog and say there are some smells here for example that we've got technical debt or we can't deliver x y and z and this that can feed into the value, value stream mapping at all uh, as well sorry or would you just kind of ignore that and just take a complete fresh piece of paper um i mean value stream mapping is the is the is the process right and 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 if we have once we're drawing out this thing you know feature to production there might be a like i'm writing code and suddenly i get distracted and people put a waste there like you know i get i get distracted all the time or there's there's things unplanned unplanned was one of the other waste cards that we okay. had um, and if, you know, five people say they're like, yeah, you know, this unplanned work that always comes up, then we might to think, start to think that the problem is upstream in the value stream, right? Probably more of the, you know, things on the backlog and the actual planning for the, for the, for the release cycle or the sprint or whatever you're doing, maybe wasn't done that well, or there's nobody protecting you <laughs> from like. Well, indeed, that, that's one, one from, point I was keen to look yeah. at as well. So what if it's a cultural problem i suppose it like if the company itself is used to working in a certain way and you identify this through value stream mapping so well basically you're getting interrupted all the time by the boss saying you need to fix this for our top customer how do you approach that i mean again it's going to say i know you're going to say it depends but um <laughs> it, it, it's sometimes not not purely a technical thing in fact probably i would say a lot of the time it's it's non-technical in nature yeah there's a really great um book that we got introduced to by colleagues as well and it's now a mandatory read in, internally which is called getting naked it's a novel a business fable as they call it about two consultancy companies and uh their the different styles when consulting and you know the good the good consultancy i won't ruin it but one of the things there is about um taking a bullet for the for the team as well that um if you're scared of losing your your work or your contract or whatever because of what you say and what you do then 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 you're not you're not getting naked um, if you're naked, then you you will be the one to to stand up and take a bullet and maybe say the things that are a bit awkward and emotionally challenging. Gotcha. Um, and I I I feel like if if we've done a value stream mapping with teams, and the this waste that we're talking about, which is caused by you know cultural or management or whatever, if that's a valid thing that many people have talked about, then I feel like I'd have enough grounds to stand on to make a point if i need to i mean it might be that the manager is in the room and he's like whoa shit like <laughs> <laughs> is is this the effect i have on you uh i mean that's a very likely scenario um um because it, it, it puts these these things out there um yeah in the open so wow i'm definitely going to read that book that will link that as well in the notes um that's so okay so just to maybe wrap this up a bit we we originally met and talked about well i found your website found the the verifer website via a search about continuous delivery and i got into the value stream mapping i read that from your website as well um and i was kind of going through a funk at the time where i was like continuous delivery is seen as a again as a hammer so how do you get to a point where you realize that you're doing enough um and i suppose i'm kind of pushing you in the direction of how do we know that we're doing a good job how do we know that yeah. we're doing enough of a good job? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really uh, I like I like these questions um, because usually with continuous delivery, I mean you, you're always going to be able to get better. Uh, it's there is there is no end game. Um, I think I wrote in that blog post something like there is no end game and time is finite because I mean that's that's the challenge, right? Um, there's always something you could change and always something you can do, but how do you know if that's going to be positive and how do you know if you even if you even need to? Um, but I think every like I, I think we'd be foolish to not not be aware or not think that there's something we can always improve on. So really, it's it's about having some justification as to like like a business case that we want to change this 
because it's going to solve and help with this. And this is, you know, roughly how much it's going to take or how much time it's going to cost. I mean, it depends where you work, how much justification is is really needed. But I feel like for the justification, um, value streams are very good because they produce this data for you. Um, they they basically tell you this. They're like, you know, there's so much waste here in the process. We want to fix this. Um, let us let us fix this. Here's what we're going to save. If you really need yeah. more of a breakdown into this, we, you know, we, we can do that for you. But it should yeah. be very clear that there's a lot of like a lot of a lot of waste in the process here. Yeah. And you talked about um, are you good enough or or or, or so on. And I know we've spoken before about the about the Dora metrics as well, and I I feel like that's, you know, like that's a good benchmark in a way. I mean, the Dora metrics are good. I wouldn't bother creating my own metrics just for the sake of having my own metrics. I would just use the Dora metrics because they mm-hmm. are, they are well thought out. They're difficult to cheat, and there are like <laughs> industry benchmarks that are updated every year, whether you're an elite performer or so on. Would I would I use that to say we need to get better or not? Probably not. No, <laughs> I'd use that more of a you know like. In, in an interesting thing, the, the benchmark. I mean, I mean, I'd use the Dora metrics to, to measure: do we get better? I wouldn't use the Dora metrics to say: do we need to get better necessarily? Yeah, I would know that if if our business is very volatile, and maybe we're quite young, and you know, we need the product market fit and these sorts of things, then I would know that our key goals would be for changeability and, and adaptability and so on. So I might try and optimize our value stream towards those. Whereas if if I'm in a very well-established company, very trusted and so on, um, then I would probably optimize. I mean, you can't get stability without throughput and so on, but, you know, I'd still optimize less for, you know, next week we might be doing something totally different. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, no, yeah. <laughs> let's, you know, like let's let's maybe fine tune this value stream as it is today and, and optimize it generally rather than, you know, um, yeah. Well, that's very interesting. The way you put it is like the value stream, after you've done the initial analysis, it sounds like it has to live as a product at that point. You have to kind of say, well, this is our the vision of that we have for our process, and this has to be reviewed. So how do you then, I mean, I've got a couple of points actually I want to bring up. The first one is when we talk about business case, it's almost like um, for, for doing more CD, it's almost like I've seen a lot of backlogs where technical debt for it'll be, be lumped under technical debt oh we need to do faster ci or this is failing or we've got read too many broken tests etc that kind of stuff and it's lumped into technical debt and maybe at the end of uh, i don't know if it's a if it's safe there'll be a, P, a pi there'll be um a sprint at the end to be able to do that or maybe it'll be there we'll have a sprint where we'll reduce it you know what that, that's the kind of reactive approach that we do see typically in a lot of companies whereas i think what you're mentioning or or maybe painting a picture of here is more like thinking about this as a living thing that we need to live with alongside all the software they're delivering as well. So our value stream of our delivery process needs to be a living thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's that's nice. That's a nice way of, of thinking about it. The The value stream that we, you know, the, the, the diagram, the exercise that we do, it creates a snapshot, right? It's a It's a snapshot in time. Yeah. Um, I I don't think it's super valuable if you know this, and and I've heard this from teams as well. Like, yeah, we drew a value stream. You know, me and me and Bob over there, we got together and drew a value stream, but it didn't really help us. And I'm like, well, of course it didn't really help you. Like, <laughs> that's just your two opinions of how you're releasing software. Um, a value stream needs to. Be, it's not just the diagram that's the value. It's the process of creating it, yeah. the process of getting people to talk, the process of you know that involvement with the team that that to me is the real value i I don't really care about the diagram at the end i mean i care about the diagram because i usually need to write reports and things afterwards (laughs) so for me it's more like triggering my memory of of, course yeah but then is what happens with the reports and what happens next is is the vital part isn't it exactly yeah but i mean these these having having um backlog items to clean up technical debt or to do whatever i mean i mean sure everybody knows it needs to be done but how urgent is it um, mm-hmm. it's, it's very difficult to prioritize those things and to know what 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 should be done um but if we if we if we can somehow relate this back to the waste in the value stream and the, the pain that people have raised you know it gives us really good grounds to make good decisions on yeah 
I mean, okay, so we have we have smells in our code base. I love this tool called Code Scene, by the way, because it, it kind of does this. And I found uh, Adam Thornhill um, is really in, like inspirational guy as well, because everyone thinks that like code smells are, are bad. Well, if your code doesn't change, then then why are you cleaning up all these code smells? But the parts of the code base that are changing all the time, maybe these code smells do have a negative yeah. effect on it. And yeah. I think these kind of like this, this context of where it depends uh, <laughs> stuff is really important too. I mean, you, your code base could be like, you could have some really old code base or part of the code base and really bad quality or whatever. And you do a value stream and nobody mentions it. You know, yeah. like there's not a single waste to say that this horrible part of the code is a problem because maybe it doesn't change. Maybe it doesn't affect anyone. So yeah. should you then start cleaning up these backlog technical debt issues for that code base? Well, probably that's not a good use of time. Yeah. Um, or it might be, you know, the complete opposite. They're like, you know, we just realized that like the three major wastes in our value stream mapping are related to the bad quality of this code base, you know, various symptoms now we know we really need to clean this up and it's going to help us tremendously. So I think that that knowledge of knowing where to invest and what to do is going to give you, you know, it's going to give you that that that, that yeah. decision for you. Brilliant. No, I think we're kind of tying it all up a little bit as well. You know, it would be lovely if we could prioritize improving our delivery process all the time, but we live in the real world, but that isn't always the case. So more often than not, it is a project or it's a, an initiative you know so you might be brought on board to write, to draw a value stream map and then six months down the line we want to see progress so how do we know that and i presume Dora metrics there would help you yeah i mean you would hope right that that um you do value stream mapping and start implementing change basically in investing in performance <laughs> yeah you, you, you'd hope to see some positive effects from that and i think you will in the Dora metrics because the door and metrics aren't goals. I mean, they don't tell you what to do. It's not like, oh, our, our lead time is high. Uh, let's fix that. It's like, yeah, but how are you going to fix that? <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't tell you how to go about doing that. But maybe all the things that come up from value stream mapping will help yeah. you yeah. reduce your reduce your cycle time and improve your lead times. Uh, I mean, yeah, you'd hope to see some positive effects. And, and I'm quite confident the door and metrics would be a good measure of that. And we wrapped up things there. Although we carried on talking for quite a lot longer than that, we touched on many items in the discussion, some of which we may have to revisit in time. If you enjoyed the show today, please like us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you consume your podcasts, and please also subscribe. It helps me keep doing what I'm doing. Until next time, this is Richard Bowne wishing you goodbye and good luck.